How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 27th video on the channel, and today we're going to be looking at the 14th, 15th, and 16th chapters of Louis Yamsu's book, Prolegomena to a Theory of Language. Last time, we looked at the A signifying units that make up signs, figure A, and the two functives that contract the sign function, the planes of expression and content. In today's video, we'll build on that understanding of expression and content and examine what Yamsu terms the linguistic schema. The first chapter we're looking at today is titled Invariance and Variance, followed by Linguistic Schema and Linguistic Usage, ending finally, but not so leastly, with Variance in the Linguistic Schema. He begins the first chapter by outlining what we talked about last episode. For him, understanding that signs are composed of two planes, expression and content, is invaluable to conducting an analysis. He goes on to add that each stage of analysis must involve the creation of an inventory of entities with uniform relations. In other words, collections of entities that always occur in the same fashion. This inventory additionally must align with the empirical principle. That's to say, it must be non-contradictory, exhaustive, and as simple as possible. The reason for these requirements is, first and foremost, because we can't tell what stage serves as the end of an analysis. Even more so, as Yamsu himself states, The requirement has a double importance for the concluding stage of the analysis, because there we come to realize the ultimate entities which are basic to the system. In order to fulfill the need for simplicity, he offers two new principles, the principle of economy and the principle of reduction. The prior, as defined by Yamsu, is based on the procedure used in analysis, whereas the latter focuses on the operations that make it up. In the first case, the principle of economy dictates that the result of such a procedure is as simple as possible, and that if it doesn't need to further simplification, it ought to be suspended. In the second, the principle of reduction, the operations that compose a procedure are repeated again and again until what's left is an exhaustive description with the least amount of objects. In other words, taking the term element to mean the entities that make up inventories, each analysis in which functives are registered with a given function as basis of analysis shall be so made that it leads to the registration of the lowest possible number of elements. In order to satisfy this requirement, he says, we have to create a method that can reduce down multiple elements into single ones. The reason this is possible is because, during the course of analysis, we can often observe quote-unquote one and the same word occurring one of the same clause, and so on. These are what he calls variants, specimens of invariants or unchanging units. To demonstrate what he means, he looks to phonetics. Phonemes, defined by the Oxford Dictionary as any perceptually distinct unit of sound, are considered to be invariants, because a change in them leads to a change in content, as can be seen with the replacement of the e in pet with an a like in pat, this is in contrast to variants, which compose all the possible different pronunciations that fall under the phoneme in question. For instance, in my dialect, I say here with a year sound instead of here. This difference is deemed variant because it entails no change in the meaning of the word, like would occur if I instead said hair, like the rabbit. It's thus that invariants and variants rely on the sign function we discussed last episode where content and expression are interdependently related, what Yamsu calls a solidarity. However, as Yamsu says, at this point we've only looked at figure A, the non-signifying component that makes up expression plane of signs. To fully understand the relationship between the two planes, we have to extend this to all other invariants found in language. Speaking of signs now, not figure A, he says, we shall always find that there is a relation between a correlation of expression and a correlation of content. If such a relation is not present, there are not two different signs. His example for this is of two sentence expressions. If exchanging the one for the other leads to a new content, then they are invariants. If not, they are simply variants. At this point, Yamsu turns his attention to reductive procedure itself giving us a walkthrough that, although I don't have time to read it out here, I'll include in the pinned comment down below. The main takeaway from his analysis 
is that the reduction always entails a generalization of some sort, albeit one that's always self-consistent in order to be in line with the empirical principle. Based on this finding, it's possible to develop yet another principle. The principle of generalization goes as follows. If one object admits a solution univocally, and another object admits of the same solution equivocally, then the solution is generalized to be valid. What this means is that, in an inventory, elements that are found to be variants can be generalized under broader invariant units. It gives an example of the words ram, you, man, woman, boy, girl, sheep, child, and human, as seen in this diagram. Through the principle of generalization, we can simplify the inventory to contain only sheep, human, and child, since the other elements are nothing more than their variants. There are thus two lines of analysis must progress along, the line of expression and the line of content. It moves now to define two different types of relationships built on correlations, which he terms commutation and permutation. To give some more context, remember what we discussed two videos ago. Correlation refers to an either-or function, where things are substituted in and out of a system. A commutation in this case refers to a correlation in the expression plane related to a correlation on the content plane. Say, for example, you exchange the letter B in bat for the letter C to form cat. That alternation in the expression system corresponds to an alternation in the content one, as you moved from winged mammal to nature's cutest killing machine. Permutation, on the other hand, is a bit harder to pin down, both due to Yamsu's very dense prose and his lack of examples. From what I understand, it involves a shift in the spoken or written chain. Take the sentence, the boy loves the girl. This can be permutated to be the girl loves the boy. It's an alteration in expression that corresponds to a like alteration in content. Summing this all up and using mutation as a general term, he says, Commutation is then a mutation between the members of a paradigm and permutation is a mutation between the parts of a chain. The opposite of commutation is what he calls substitution, where units can enter into a system without rocking the boat. In other words, a correlation does not take place. He is now able to form and define invariants as units with mutual commutation, and variants as units with mutual substitution. Ending the chapter, he says, both the study of expression and the study of content are a study of the relation between expression and content. These two disciplines presuppose each other. In his opinion, any attempt to study the one whilst excluding the other is something that can only lead to serious harm. With this, we get to chapter 15, Linguistic Schema and Linguistic Usage. Yamsu starts out by saying that linguists must be equally interested in both the similarities and differences between languages. As he puts it, the similarity between languages is their structural principle, whilst the differences relate to carrying out that principle concretely. With this, he turns back to the amorphous mass of all possible contents and expression that he terms purport. Upon first glance, it may appear obvious that purport is an example of an underlying similarity, but Yamslu says this isn't so. The reason being that this purport can only be conceived of in terms of formed substances. In his words, The purport is formed in a specific fashion in each language, and therefore no universal formation is found, but only a universal principle of formation. He essentially gives a kind of primacy to form of a substance. The difference between languages isn't based on separate realizations of a type of substance, but rather on the different ways that substance is formed. To clear up what he means by purport, Yamsu now looks at different sciences that involve it in one way or another, his first examples being physics and anthropology. In the first case, the two planes of expression and content both involve physical entities. For the prior, sounds or gestures, and for the latter, things like trees and ring telephones. In the second case, substance is additionally conceived differently based on the perspective of each language's users. For Yamslu, it's of the utmost importance that linguistics involves other sciences, since that's the only way it can be truly exhaustive. This is true uh, especially in the case of purport. 
which Yamsu sees as undescribable by non-linguistic sciences, as it lies outside the sign function. Moving on, he says linguistics' main focus ought to be on establishing a science of content and a science of expression. Sciences that don't rely on the premises suggested by other scientific fields dealing with purport. Outlining this, he says, Such a science would be an algebra of language, operating with unnamed entities, in other words, arbitrarily named entities without natural designation. It's this algebra that Yamsu is seeking to outline in this book, which he christens glossomatics, after the Greek word for language. In order to further differentiate the substance of non-linguistic sciences from that of glossomatics, he in turn names the smallest unit of his theory, the glossy, defined as the irreducible invariance of language. Ending the chapter, he says that linguistic hierarchy will, from now on, be termed the linguistic schema. Additionally, the resultants of the non-linguistic hierarchy, when they are ordered into a linguistic schema, shall be called the linguistic usage. On their relationship, Yamsu says that linguistic usage manifests the linguistic schema, putting it into action as it were. In a way, this is the closest he gets to the distinction between Long and Bechol in Sassu's work, where the prior, somewhat analogous to the linguistic schema, refers to the abstract rules and conventions of language, whilst the latter, analogous to linguistic usage, corresponds to its concrete uses, to speech translating literally. With that, we now arrive at the last chapter we'll be looking at today, variants of a linguistic schema. Yamsu begins by saying that every single functive in the schema can be articulated into variants. He adds on that these articulations aren't particular, in other words, unlimited to one specific form. There are an arbitrary number of ways to produce variants of the same thing, and as such, they are termed virtual by Yamsu. Continuing onwards, he now seeks to describe how linguistics in his time divided up variants into those that were considered free, meaning that they could appear in any context where their invariant appears, and those which were considered bound, depending on context. However, Yamsu isn't a very big fan of these words. Instead, he suggests that they ought to be termed variations and varieties, respectively. Describing the first, he says, Variations are defined as combined variants, since they are not presupposed by, and do not presuppose, any definite entities as coexisting in the chain. In other words, they don't require anything else around them to behave the way they do. This is in stark contrast to the second category, of which he states, Varieties are defined as solidary variants, since a given variety always presupposes and is presupposed by a given variety of another invariant in the chain. Connected to my mention of solidarities earlier in the context of a sign function, solidary variants refer to units that are interdependent on other parts of a chain. In other words, one variety must come with another variety, and it's impossible to have them exist by themselves. At this point, it's important to note that, although we've only focused on expression, the very same thing exists on the plane of content, where contextual meanings abound. Returning to Venny Irins themselves, he spits them out further into individuals and localized varieties. The prior occurs when a variation can't be further broken down into other variations, and, as the name suggests, the latter is the exact same just with varieties instead. At first, this may seem to contradict the fact that variants are virtual, since if they can be exhausted, that ought to mean that they must be limited. However, Yamsu steps around this issue by saying that although the mouth is limited in what it can produce, an unrestricted linguistic process, like a living language, can still theoretically contain infinite variants. Ending the chapter, he attacks syntax as a discipline, the study of the connections between words. Based on what we've just learnt, we can describe its object, words, clauses and phrases, as a study of variants, or more accurately, the study of varieties. Where the trouble comes in is that it looks only to varieties on the plane of content, considering the meaning of groups of words, not their expression. A large theme that runs throughout almost all of Yamsu's work is the importance of keeping the two connected. As such, he says, syntax isn't exhaustive. Now. 
This concludes chapters 14, 15, and 16 from Louis Yamsu's book Prolegomena to Theory of Language. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better next time. Until then, bye!